Hey guys, Chris here with Call to Wander, and today's video is a long video, but it's really, really important if you are considering replacing the cooling unit in your RV refrigerator. We have the Dometic 2652. It's a very common refrigerator. Our RV is a 1999 Class C motorhome. It's a Shasta Cheyenne, which means this refrigerator right here was manufactured probably in 1997, 98, so that it could be installed in this particular motorhome. That being said, it's a very common refrigerator. So if you're watching this and you're wondering um, whether what we're about to show you relates to your refrigerator, chances are, if it's not exactly identical, um, it'll be very, very similar in the process. Just a disclaimer to let you know, we did not replace the cooling unit ourselves. We actually hired somebody and this guy was amazing. Not only did he replace the unit um, for us, through a friend of a friend we connected with, but he also explained the process. So what you're gonna see is Frank explaining a whole lot of things as he goes through and replaces the cooling unit. And I can tell you it's not a job. I can DIY a lot of things in our camper, but this is definitely one that I chose not to DIY. Uh, and I'm glad now that I've seen how complicated the process is. Just to give a little bit of a background, we were traveling in Baja, Mexico several months ago when our RV refrigerator, our Dometic RM2652, completely died on us. We panicked like most people would at first, and we were able to borrow a cooler. We did the whole ice thing for a little while as we tried to figure out what is the situation. Do we have to drive back to the United States? What can we do right here? So there were three basic options that we came across. The first was buy a new residential fridge. They're very expensive. We don't have that kind of money, $2,000 plus, um, but it would fit perfectly in this place. We could take the old one out, pop the new one in. That's the idea if we had the money to do that. You're watching this video probably because you, like us, don't have the money just to go out and buy a brand new residential or brand new RV fridge to pop in here. Which leads to option number two. A lot of people we consulted with said, why don't you get a residential refrigerator? Runs off of a little bit of power. You can plug it into your inverter and at that point, you can basically have the same refrigerator, but it's not an RV fridge. There were a couple things we did look at that, but they didn't fit perfectly in here and we had already remodeled our RV, so we didn't want to have to go in and change anything. We didn't want to have to build any structures or cover up any gaps that may exist with the residential fridge. We also were a little bit skeptical and I know that there are plenty of people out there with residential fridges in their RVs, but we were skeptical about how much wear and tear they could handle. We do have a robust solar panel setup and a huge battery bank. So we weren't entirely worried if we just kept it plugged in all the time, uh, but we did like to have the option of keeping our refrigerator. As we found out in this process, this particular model, the older models are very well made. They were made in Sweden back in the time before they are now made in China, um, but they were made in Sweden. They were done very well. So the idea of remanufacturing and putting in a remanufactured cooling unit was our third option and that appealed to us tremendously because again we love this refrigerator we couldn't afford a new rv refrigerator we didn't want to take a chance on the residential fridge and all the finagling we'd have to do so we decided we were going to replace the cooling unit in this particular refrigerator we did get consultation of all places in baja there was a refrigerator expert from british columbia who happened to be camping right next door to us and he came by said yeah one your refrigerator is shot two it is possible for you to do the cooling unit replacement on your own. There are several companies on the internet that you can reach out to. They'll ship you a newly refurbished one. You ship back your old one, kind of like a core, and you can install it yourself. Did a little research, and again, that was well beyond me. So as you watch this video, know that this is not me, Chris with Call to Wander, doing the cooling unit replacement. This is in fact somebody who knows much more about what they're doing and we are 100% confident in our decision to go with that. It is more than just taking out four screws, turning off the propane, pulling things out, putting things back in. There was a lot to it. That being said, let's get into this video. It is the most thorough video you will find out there on how to do a DIY cooling unit replacement. So if you are interested in going that route and saving the dollars and you are somewhat mechanically inclined, but you haven't actually done a replacement like this, this video will walk you through step-by-step step exactly what you need to know, how to do it, including some little tips and tricks, things that some professionals will often overlook, or if you go to the dealership, they may cut some corners, that you can avoid cutting those corners by watching this video. Again, we hired a professional who helped us through this, and we are glad that we did that. So let's get into watching how it's done from start 
to finish. Yes, we've been on the road using this refrigerator with the new cooling unit for several months now, and the cooling unit works better than the original that we had. So we are excited about how well it's working. And hopefully again, if you DIY this, you should be able to do it after this video. If not, there are people out there who can help you from a professional standpoint, and at least this video will help you make the decision whether or not you want to take on the job yourself. What went bad on your unit is the boiler assembly. That's this piece here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, uh, the one that you have on there is 16 gauge or 60 thousandths, 1 16th wall thickness. I replace it with one that is 11 gauge, 120 thousandths or 1 8th wall thickness. It's actually twice as thick as the one you got on there. So it will not uh, do the, the same thing. It will not breach like this one did. The other thing that's really great is your gray one and this one, they are actually made in Sweden. Huh. The ones they have nowadays are made in China. Your Chinese one will last about uh, one to three years. These ones here, it, they're just starting to go out uh, 96, 97, 98. To tell you the difference in longevity. Wow. Right there. They're that expensive of a fridge too. And they're not they cheap. Yellow stuff is the rust inhibitor in here. If you ever see yellow, pretty much your unit's toast. Even if it's still cooling, uh, the chances are it's going to be only lasting a little while longer. Sorry about right. that guy. You're right. So. And what would have caused this? Would somebody previously was parking too on level nope, or nothing? Nope, nope. What causes this, that's a very good question. What causes this is the rust inhibitor eventually breaks down, okay? The weakest part of this right here, and again, you can see the yellow in there right now. It's easier to show you on this one. Okay, I'm gonna turn this upside down so it's a little easier to see. So now, this is the heat tube. This whole system runs off of, of heat, okay? So this is where your heating element goes. For these ones, it's 325 watt, okay, at 120 uh, volts AC. So what happens is, is this is where it's welded is the weakest part of the whole fridge, the whole cooling unit. So when it starts, the rust inhibitor, the yellow stuff starts to, uh, to degrade, okay, it will literally eat itself from the inside out. And since these things run at a, the pressure on these are about 350 PSI, okay, that's the breach point. Um, like nine out of 10, this is where they will fail, right there. Okay, on the newer ones, they don't even get a chance to fail there. The newer ones, they actually get micro leaks inside here, which is what causes them to fail, which is the evaporator. Again, this is upside down. But that is what causes them to fail in the new ones. The leaks are so small and they look like brand new, but if you were if they die within one to three years, obviously they'll look brand new. You know? If you try to put a, a Phillips driver in there right now with all the rust in there, all you're gonna do is strip that recess out. So what you want to do is you're going to want to take and you're going to want to flush out the recess before you put a Phillips in there, okay? And that will give you a better chance on actually breaking it free. This is when you don't want to cheat. Right now is when you do not want to cheat on this stuff. And the chances of, of you getting it out is going to be a little bit better. And right now, see how it's stripped out? It already stripped out, so we're gonna have to drill this out to get it out, okay? And that was because it was so rusted, it was impossible. That's the only way to give you a chance to do it. Uh, you get galvanic corro uh, corrosion, so when you go to try to pull them off, sometimes they come off easy, like right now, okay, and sometimes you got to put a little bit of the WD. What it does is it stops the, uh, it, it separates them, and that see how much easier that to slid off. This was kind of tough. This one just this slid off. So instead of you, you trying to fight these things, you just put a little bit of WD. WD is dielectric, which means it has no conductivity of electricity. So if you put it on an electrical component, it will not short the component out because you, when you turn it on. Might, might be soft enough to get out. 
that's new within a year we put that motherboard in oh it's soft okay yeah but yeah so that's that's the that's the deal with that yeah dinosaur makes really good boards Ground. Cool. Very yeah. analytical, so I numbered everything to make sure I could put it back. Well, yeah, I would do the same thing. Except for I know where everything goes. Yeah. Okay. So now, it is good to number it for that reason. Okay. The other ones you don't have to take off. So now we're going to take, disconnect. The igniter wire. Take this little screw out here. The newer, the newer fridges, this igniter is actually built into the board. It's a combo. It doesn't have an extra. So if you don't see one of these, that's because this igniter wire that ignites your spark is actually built down into here. All that's done. Yes. Take all these out. Chances of these breaking these little clips because we zip time afterwards is very high. It's amazing that these things for how old this unit is is not breaking apart. That's a good sign. Okay, so now everything else here is off. Okay, we got this screw drilled out. We got to un undo this right here. Now on a on normally what I do, you can turn the gas off for safety reasons if you're going to do it yourself. Uh, what I do is I actually leave the uh, the gas valve and burner assembly attached onto here if if I if I can. That way, if it's like winter time, if they're cooking or washing, you can still keep the furnace going. Uh, you can keep the hot water going. If you're a novice doing this for the first time, just turn the gas off for safety reasons. This older unit here. This bracket will be welded on. After 2002, this bracket is actually bolted on here. So that's how you can kind of tell the age of the fridge hmm. right here. If um, you also have this older model of Dometic, you have a, a screw here and an extra screw on this side. Okay, so that's the screw right here. Besides the screw that's actually holding the fridge in, you got to take this screw off. The, the identical ones are on this other side also. So we're going to take those screws out right now. So you got that screw, and then you got your screw that's actually holding the fridge on. Rusty, obviously, replace them with new ones. It's holding the back first, which is this one right here. Get this out of the way. Comes out easy. When you see it come out that easy, that means your floor's not rotted. That's a good thing. When it's just spinning around. Now, this other one is spinning right here. Mm -hmm. So, as it's spinning around when you're trying to get it out, Add some pressure see how underneath. it's not going? So, what you're going to do is you can actually take this and you can go, you can go either way. It doesn't matter and put a little pressure on it as you're lifting it. And once it catches on the first thread, it'll come out. Just like that. So now it came out. So what was happening was, it was, if you can see underneath the, th the head, there's no threads. And that's why it was just spinning. So once you got to the first thread, it came out super easy. A lot of this stuff, when you're using this WD, you should do it and then just let it sit a while to break the screws free. This is the 12 volt wires? Yeah, these are the 12 volt wires. Sometimes you can't get them out. And when you can't get them out, you can put another set of terminals on there if you want. Because when they've screwed them in, sometimes, like right there, it feels like it's wore out or it's slipping because it's already out. Gotta be careful on that. It's slipping because it's already out. Good. So 
we got that, that. We still have a grounding wire down here. Now, here we go. Now, the older Dometics like this one, okay, all of this here has to go out with the fridge. When you do that, and when you take the cooling unit off, all of this is gonna drop to the floor, okay? The newer style, the ones that they made, like uh, this one's actually a, a 2000, it could be anything from a 2001 or older when the fridge was manufactured. Remember, all fridges are one year older than the RVs. So what, what it could be is, 2000 and newer when this bracket here was put back here you could literally take hundred percent of this off from the backside but the older ones like this when you pull the fridge out this stuff here will drop down and right now we're gonna try to get this off it's a little rusty let's pull this up a little bit you can see the rust on these things here which is making it a little difficult that's the other thing about these is they got uh, Now that's not because it's bolted in anymore, that's just rust holding it in. And it's rusted pretty good. Once the rust gets broke free, it will come loose, but. Dissolve the rust. Start to come, there it goes, just like that. And yes, the WD-40 did help. Okay, so now everything on the whole back is disconnected. I'm going to put these wires up here, I'll have them safe keeping. Get your heating element wires also. Obviously the heating element was shorted out. So I only got one left on there that's going to be replaced. And so what you're going to do now is going to make sure everything's separated. That's going to the stuff that's going to go with the fridge and the stuff is going to stay back here. If you're a one man band, what you want to do is you want to you're going to once you get this ready to slide out, you're going to come back out here and check it a couple of times just to make sure Everything's coming out smoothly. Okay, so now with everything else being disconnected back here, now we're gonna go inside and do the same to the front. We're gonna disconnect everything on the front. These door knobs here, uh, they stopped making them. Uh, these on this year of Dometic are 50 bucks a piece if you buy them. So you can also buy the newer versions, which is a larger one, which when you look, oh, when you see a new Dometic nowadays, they'll have a bigger handle. They also fit the same spot. They're just gonna be drilling on one extra hole here, but if you wanna save it, they're about 15 bucks each instead of 50 for one of these. And this is the part that breaks in these things. So now in the freezer section, I'm gonna take this out. Take your mini ice cube tray out. Cool. Okay, this here, pull this back on one side. How did you get it out? They're smart dogs. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now we're going to worry about the threads here. The uh, I'm sorry, the screws again, and it's the same thing where you want to flush them. Let me go get some uh, WD. But these, it's the same thing. You want to flush out the holes if you have any debris in them. The white stuff is just the uh, zinc plating on them. Or this is these are these are CAD plated, I think. That's what it is. It's just same thing where you want to flush them out. You always want to go in straight, push, and that's and they'll come out. These ones, usually you can get them all out. The fins sometimes are a burger, depending on what they look like. 
Okay, this is ready here. We're gonna take these out. There's two screws up there. When you do that, you're gonna have a, a little slot right here. You just push that slot gently and it'll pop right out. And then you've got your screws up here. When, it, when you're bouncing down the road like this one right here, it's so, uh, it's, it's, it's literally wobbled its way out. Hmm. So obviously you don't need a driver for that one. Now how these are designed, which is kind of neat, Dometic, when you screw these in, these tabs actually drive themselves into the wood. So what it does is when you're bouncing down the road, that little tab digs into the wood. You have to usually take a screwdriver and pull this down. If you don't, if you don't pull the tab back down, because usually it's dug up in the wood, when you go to pull this free, you will take and break this out. And sometimes that's some pretty nice finishing up there. It will literally snap it off. So always make sure you pull these tabs down on both sides. Yeah, I never knew that. We're going to put a little larger screw in both of those. And again, same as the other side. Make sure this, this one's kind of up there already. Pull this down so that it actually is the same. Now, you're just going to put this right back where it was. Safe keeping. So now everything on the top is done. Now we're gonna go down four screws in the fins and then two screws down on the bottom and this thing's ready to get pulled out. Got it. Okay, the same thing here. You're gonna take the drip pan out and you got a little plug there that came off of something. And then I'm gonna take this one out. Usually you have this one, they're out, but there's usually plastic tabs. You, can, you have to pop up to slide these, these out of the way. I've never known them to fall out. So when we're missing the tabs, everything's still fine. Now we're gonna take this, your thermistors, and pull this off. And again, as before, I'm gonna flush out the recesses. And these are the ones that will literally give you problems. Because if the recesses are not flushed out, when you go, you get one chance to unscrew them. Other than that, you're gonna drill them out. Now you have to use an extension drill because you cannot get a drill deeper than these fins. So you really wanna make sure, the same as before, make sure you're inside of it. And inside the recess, first time, you only got about three turns that are actually holding these fins in. Okay, so these fins will actually come out. They're actually stuck to the back of the cooling unit. So when I go to pull it out, the fins are going to go with it. Because of that, okay, they use double-sided tape down here on the bottom, okay? So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to separate this, this, this little apron down here. We're going to have to separate it from, with the double-sided tape before we pull this out, okay? So I've got a bent screwdriver for that. You guys can use a bent butter knife, anything you got. Uh, if you don't do that, when you go to pull out the cooling unit, you will tear this dramatically. Okay, I've seen that happen more times than not. Um, and that's another thing where I never lay these down uh, when I'm changing them. That is something that happened years ago by a gentleman who actually used to rebuild and everybody afterwards thought you gotta lay them face down in order to change the cooling unit. I will show you that you do not. Okay, I'm gonna go get a bent screwdriver. You can, if you ever wanna do this for a job, you know, you can get a nice one. You can get one for $2 at Harbor Freight that does the same thing. Or you can just bend a piece of metal and what you're wanting to do is you're wanting to actually go in between the fins and make sure that this is separated this one looks like it's already pretty well separated okay so if you make sure this is like this when you go to pull it out sometimes they're really tough in here this one's actually pretty easy to get out so now all we have is two screws on the bottom we're gonna pull this piece off. 
and the fridge will be ready to come out. Again. And this one over here. This one could be a burger to get out. This was easy. Sometimes you have to to get this one out because it will literally the head will go underneath this bracket you have to loosen these two up and get a little pry bar and move it to get the the head from back underneath this to get it straight out we were very lucky this time so now all you got to do is take this piece out of the way yeah. and voila that's it so uh, what I'm gonna do right now is to see if it's free like just tugging on here, it's free. This is <laughs> this is very important here. Most of these fridges are heavy. They've been in here for years, if not decades. Okay, they all settle. So when you go to push them out, the same as the top, you want to make sure that you're not going to damage this. And what you're going to do is you're going to take another pry bar and just lift up, and it'll it'll raise your fridge up and allow you to come out with it, just like that. So now, you got uh, this on both sides, over here too, let's raise it up a little bit, and it'll actually walk it out. Nice thing about Dometics, this is metal. <coughs> Excuse me, if this was a Norcold, these would be plastic on the side, you would not want to grab from the side. You grab from the top or the bottom on a Norcold. This one, it's metal all the way around, it's really easy. So you just rock it out, go back outside when you're by yourself, if you don't have a spotter in the back, to make sure that everything's clear before you go and, and everything is clear, this is what, everything's nice and clear away so when it slides out, you're not gonna be grabbing anything and causing any problems. So that's what that's for. Right there, so we can easily get it out now. Great. You can buy the small ones, two of the small ones, and you could build a box up on this, the same level as your fridge to slide it out on. This is for a one man can do this. You don't need two guys, and you don't need to scratch up your RV in the process. But these furniture dollies work really well. So now, what I'm going to do with this, Harbor Freight also, second one I've owned. I'm literally going to bring this up right underneath the feet you gotta be real careful if there's drawers under there not to hit the handles when you're doing this and in fact you might want to just take the handles off before you do it just to where it touches once it touches you can actually just slide it out onto it now like right here if there was something here like gonna hit here you're gonna drop this down a little lower okay this down a tiny bit okay now as you can see we got room to get from underneath this we didn't need to do that but sometimes you have stuff in the way like a, a, a light yeah. so now I'm gonna take this out And once it's clear of everything, you can bring it down to the floor. Make sure you're not gonna be hitting anything on the way down. Unfortunately, if you use the box, you're not gonna do that. Okay, so now we're ready to take the screws off the back. And this is the back side of the fridge here. This rust that you see, this is indicative of a unit starting to go bad. This is the rectifier, okay? As the fridge loses its, its ammonia, you, the ammonia can degrade. It's three parts hydrogen, one part nitrogen gas. That's what ammonia is made out of. By running it off level and overheating it, you can get the ammonia to where it breaks down or it just flat out breaks down throughout the years. It's not like Freon, not like your rooftop AC, 
or your refrigerator, which pretty much, unless the stuff leaks out, it stays the same and stable. Ammonia will actually uh, break back down to its two gases. So anyway, as it's going, it, this will get hotter and hotter. Originally, it looked like this here, and then it turned to this, and then it turned to this. Uh, if this thing would not have leaked, this thing would have just kept getting hotter and hotter and burning off the paint all the way up. But this is also a telltale sign of what happened. So now, what we got is, we basically got four screws, we got some uh, uh, some zip ties to cut off, and then uh, we got to pull the thing out. If this was a black colored unit, that means it was made uh, 06 or newer, you can pull these out almost just with your hands. They will come out super easy. These units here, through this little plastic fitting here, okay, they literally foam the cooling unit inside the cabinet. So uh, with that said, they use a membrane and they use silicone grease to, uh, to make it so you can actually separate it so you can replace this. A lot of techs will tell you that, you know, you have to replace the whole fridge. That's not true. They designed these so you, you could replace the cooling unit, and that's why they put the membrane. If, if they didn't put the membrane in there, then it would be like permanently you throw the whole fridge away. But this can be repaired. The manufacturer made it so. There's one here. There's always one right here. These are on the Dometics. There's always one on the drain tube. Now, very important, the newer Dometics, a lot of these drain tubes are white. You may not even see them. If you squeeze them, they will crumble. They disintegrate. The black ones, they last forever. The white ones will just decompose. At that point, you got to go to like uh, Home Depot, get some 5-8 uh, uh, tubing, and you could put, make these yourself, but you need that drain tube and you need, it, you need it outside or you could actually get a rotted floor because of it. So now what we're going to do, we got a little mud dauber here, no big deal. We got four screws to take out. Right here, one, two, we got three, four on the bottom. Got a little guard on the bottom here. We got one more. I'm going to rotate it over here so I can get to it. Right here. Now we took everything else off outside, so all of this is free. Remember when I told you when I go to pull the cooling unit off, this will drop down to the floor. I'm also going to put a moving blanket down here to protect the floor. Start with a piece of wood down here and they pry to get it out. Uh, other ones like some of the videos you see, they'll, they'll start digging here and dig all the way in. It's very time consuming. Uh, this is the way I take them out. And again, remember, double check to make sure all the screws are out from the inside before you do this. One screw will make this so you will not be able to get this out. This is the same thing you'd see as if you saw a steering wheel pull it basically for a car. So I do have the other piece on here where you can clamp it on both sides and just screw it out by hand, but I found out I don't need it. So basically, right there, the bottom. So now, as you can see, it comes up pretty easy. Take all the screws out, it comes out a lot easier. Okay, if you have heavy doors on the front, you gotta make sure, if there's not two of you, that the fridge is not so much forward that it tips over. So you gotta be real careful of that. And there is the unit out. Right there. Oh. 
Okay, here's a big thing here. These fins here, if you breathe on them wrong, they will break off. Okay, they're very, they're rooted on very, very gently. So if they do come off, I'm going to show you how to fix them before you put the thing back on. So the, when, you're, when you're walking out the door with this thing, you got to be real mindful of these fins. Okay, you breathe wrong and these will come off. I mean, they're that, they're that gentle. I've seen them where people have cleaned the inside of their fridge and knocked them off and used a sheet metal screw to screw them back in only to go into the evaporator oh. and get a face full of ammonia. Yeah. So when you go, when we take this off, I'll show you how to put a fin back on. You can put them on when it's off real easy. Sometimes it takes a little mochi. Wow, that was good. That was easier than it's ever come off. So now you can see back here what's left. This is thermal conductive putty. It's supposed to be nice, soft, and pliable. It's not. This is what allows you to get thermal conductivity to the flat surfaces right here. Um, I clean these so you get more surface area. You get more surface area on the rebuilt one. They bolt these in, they put the thermal conductor putty in, and then they foam it. So what you see here is extra. Um, it won't get as cold as the newer one, as the rebuilt one because of that. So now, What we're gonna do is we're gonna take off the back of this and we're gonna put the insulation on the back of this one. You got a baffle, always make sure you put the baffle. You need this, okay, for your uh, for your flame on when you're burning on gas. This right here allows it to heat up the area where your heating element is a lot more. If you forget to put this in, your fridge will not get cold. It will not get warm enough to work. So it's a must that when you get ready to put her back in that this is in the new cooling unit. You can see back here, so when you if one of these if one of these gets popped off, okay, they only go on one way, okay? If one of them gets popped off, you look back here to where your tube goes and you can screw it in any place where the tube is not. So you can take the new screws you don't even, you can use this plain sheet metal screws, it'll go through this and screw it back on. You need only like three of them per and you're good to go again. It will never come off. But that's if you, if you accidentally break one off. Now, if, if you break it off while it's all together, it's a good idea not to try to put it back in because the chances of you actually hitting uh, the evaporator with 350 PSI of pressure is pretty good. So it's good not to do it otherwise. So right now we're just going to take off all the components that we're going to put onto that one. Squeeze this together, pops off. Same, flip it upside down. That's a piece that we need. A shield. We go to put the new one on. thing here. This one's easier if you take this off first. Take the four tabs. Like this. Move this down a little bit. I'll pull this off. Now, See where the heating element got hot. This is why you need a new heating element. It literally welded itself to the inside of this and shorted it out here. So, and this is the tube that breached the boiler, and this is the one that's replaced with one twice as thick right here. 
So, very, very important. When you go to put these fins back in, the holes are not in the middle. On a Dometic, on a Dometic, okay, the holes are on the higher side. Have you noticed? And that's how you're gonna put it back in. If you don't remember, mark it before you take it out, okay? So now, we're gonna put this back in and we're gonna tape it. So now what we're gonna do is remember, holes on the high side. Like that. And I'm gonna put a little piece of tape down here on the bottom, foil tape. You can tape it around too. If you feel this, just touch a little bit and you can feel that there's, it feels like grease. That's mm -hmm. the silicone. That's the releasing agent I was talking about. Okay, so that's what's got to, that's how come it's able to be pulled out. Here, there's a little part where it kind of melted. Okay, that's, uh, this fiberglass is woven glass and it literally melted it enough to melt that. Uh, it's, it's good. I always keep a spare amount of insulation to replace the part that was damaged or melted and then remove the yellow part you don't have to take it all out just a lot of it where it's uh and you could actually use household insulation if you wanted to but you can see how thin that got that's all, it's like cotton candy when water hits it. The same thing happens to this. It just shrinks back to its glass form. So, now, i put this back on here. Right in this area where the heating element actually melted it, I'm just going to stuff some more in here. And I'm just going to get a little more. Put that. Same area where it was. And voila. So, we can fold these back down on them so we can stuff a little more inside here. Kind of even it out a little bit. And again, you can use just plain old. The brown stuff you can get nowadays is a little more heat resistant, you'll see. But if you do that, make sure you wear gloves because that stuff's got like shards of fiberglass in it. And you can take this. Put this back on. Oops, wrong way. This way. There we go. Just like that. Fold it down. When you do that, you can put the cover back on it. Voila. And that part, now we flip it over to the other side. The newer ones, all this you can put on from the back side. These ones you can't. Just like that. And I'll take a piece of that foil tape and tape the bottom of it. That's the only nice thing about the older ones. You could do this out here, so the majority of the work, once you slide it in the hole, it's already done. The newer ones, they're just as easy. They're just in a different way, they're easy. So all I'm gonna do with this is stick this down here on the bottom. This is so that it will not, when you right side it, turn it right side up, it will not fall off. And again, make sure all your wires are where they can't be flopping around as you're moving stuff around, stuff like that. You know, you can unwrap them after you get everything where it's supposed to go. Then, OK. 
Okay. Now we can turn it this way. Finish the top side. Do not forget to ask yourself where the baffle is because if it doesn't get cold on gas and it gets cold on electric, there you go, that's why. Got a nice little hole right here that this little thing goes into. So you lay this right back down into there, pinch it. And that also stops this when you're pushing up from going up all the way. And that's ready to be reinstalled. What's that, cleaner? Yeah. It's cleaner, yeah. Trying to take some of the some of the some of the slippery silicone off the bottom so the paint will, or the the uh, stuff will stick. This is all the old thermal conductive putty, thermal mastic. You'll get it in a tube, I buy it in bulk. So I'm actually going to apply it by hand. You would probably get a cartridge. Some of the rebuilders are they're doing it in bulk now. And they're giving you a little tube to squeeze. crucial just simple turtle wax that's all you want to do and all you want to do is just do the cavity of this like this it's not like a car where you have to polish it you just apply it it's literally car wax yep just literally car wax you have any excess you can wax your car <laughs> I'm only gonna do this once if you use this before you foam the cooling unit in, and this is for all you guys that buy other people's units. I don't care, but if you use this, and you ever have to take your unit out on a warranty, you can get it out without having to saw it out. Other than that, you will literally have to saw the unit to get it out. It does not affect the foam whatsoever. I've used this stuff for two decades. Although it rarely, and I mean super rarely, ever happens. If I've ever had to pull one of my units, I was sure glad I did this. That's it. You don't have to wait for it to dry. You don't have to polish it. You're done. And you can use the rest on your car. If it was a hot day, this would be in the shade. Because this thing would be like... <laughs> it goes fast. So, being that it is not hot, this is great stuff. You can, red can is what I use. You can use blue. Never use black. Black, the, the big gap you don't need. Okay, so now what we're going to do is I'm going to uh, put the thermal conductive putty on the evaporator and then after that set that aside, put a bead of foam in here, have my four screws ready to screw the unit back in from the back side. Okay, you had Phillips in here. You had these screws. These are number 10s. We're going to replace them with number 12s. Every time you go into sheet metal, it gets a little weaker, so we're just going to put a slightly larger screw in there to make it hold better. What I'm going to do, we're going to get this in there, set it in a spot. Looks like right where your oven is, is really good. Gently set it right here. And it still has a blanket underneath it. That's a good thing. Thermal conductive putty in a 55 gallon barrel, that's why it looks like this. You will probably get it in a tube. And then I'm gonna turn around and wanna swap places with me. Get over on this side. And I'll 
just basically put this stuff on. This stuff that I get, the company I get it from, I've seen this stuff 25 years and it's still as pliable as it is now unlike that other stuff. It does not harden. You do not want this stuff to harden throughout the years. When it hardens it loses its capability to pull heat out of the back. What happens is that through expansion and contraction of the heat it will uh, separate from the flat wall and it won't be touching anymore. When it's not touching the surface it's not able to draw the heat out. And this is why I have the blanket underneath in case if anything drops. If you notice, I missed this spot here. That's because that's not touching anything. If you notice the metal there, that's the piece that sits in between both aluminum pieces right there. So that's why you don't see me doing that part. And this isn't a toaster strudel, so don't drizzle it. Make sure you get it on the evaporator, not just drizzling it. You want a full contact. Okay, so now we're just gonna take the foam. Be mindful of this. If this was hot, when you hit this, it was gonna blow up like a, just, uh, like a bomb. So these ones here have a little green thing that shows when it's on and off. It's reusable, actually. Open up very gentle. Just gonna put a little bead. And then on this side. And they're trying to go upside down. We're gonna go right here. Ready to put this in. Get those little feet down there. And you're going to take your wires and put them right back exactly where they were. Take these and also take your drain tube, move it out here, and these wires you can actually stick down through here. You're also going to have the thermistor wire that's down here already. Again, pull them all back, right back where they were before. Tuck them in just like you had before. And slowly push it in. If you push it in fast, that foam could go poof and, and inundate your RV with foam all over the place. And nobody will be happy about that. <clears throat> okay, so now, Put these two in. We got two more for the floor. When you're doing the floor, get it one more look at your wires to make sure there's no wires underneath here and the drain tubes out. goes like this. And then that's it. Presto changeo. So that is basically what you got for the back. Put a couple of zip ties back where they were before. 
zip ties. Okay, those are in. Now I just do the little zip ties, and then the back's pretty well it. And this we're gonna leave loose, and we're gonna turn around and go inside and make sure that this hasn't pulled back so much that, you know, you're, you're short-changed. And just put these back in. Okay. Here. You kind of want them semi loose so you can, if you need to move them around, you're not really centered just to hold them on the back side. And you got your, your drain tube. Okay, so everything on the back is done. Always remember that baffle's in. Now all you gotta do is tuck all your goodies back in. So when you go to slide it in the back, now these wires end up underneath again. Okay, so everything's clear here, nothing's there. Again, nothing is, is in between that you're gonna have something pinched. Now we can get this out of the way. Take your little bumper goodie out of the way. There you go, thank you. And since we have Ton of mud daubers. I can see right now. We're gonna get those from the back side. They're on the ground inside there. Use water, oh, and it'll come off real easy. Usually, should put a bucket on that underneath it and throw it away. But that's about it. You don't got to do much to it. It'll come off pretty simple. And. You can paint this if you want, but then you risk the chance of painting the uh, burner, the spud, the jet, or the, the grates here, so it's best just to leave it alone. So Do we need to worry about that rusting anymore? No, nope. Okay. That'll last you guys another 15, 20 years before anything happens again. And sometimes those like leave it a tiny bit lower and then tip it to get it in. Like that. So when I do that, I can either drop this, or if you if you didn't, you can lift this and just roll it out of the way. Once once the heater in there, this will come right out on this. I'm not gonna push it in all the way because I wanna go to the back and make sure that everything's fine before we slide it in all the way. Make sure nothing is obstructing it. Looks pretty good. Pull it out again. 
not square enough. <clears throat> the reason they use oval heads is they got a really deep drive to them for being a flathead. Flathead. <laughs> flush head. They're not really flush. You don't want a hammer on them or they'll strip. And there it is, nice and tight. Okay, so this is finished right here. Now we're gonna do the, I'll clean up that in a sec. I'm gonna get the, the bottom fins in. This is where, if you made a mistake and put it upside down, you'd be in trouble. That's why it's very important to remember that. I didn't know you were there. Okay. I thought I'd get your freaking Phillips back. Okay, so that's that. Okay. That's why you leave it loose so you can pull it back a little bit. You know what I'm saying? You don't zip tie that thing in. So now, uh, your, your drip pan over here. One sec. With the thermistor, the uh, higher you go, it does nothing. Does don't nothing. even bother. Okay, just put it in there. That's done. That, they do that for one reason, so you don't call Domatic and ask where your adjustment is. <laughs> I mean it. That's cool. It does nothing up and down. The only time it does something is when it's away from the fins. You know, the the little aftermarket adjustment part, the part that uh, there's a part that uh, you can you can stick on the side, clip the tip of it, wire it in, and adjust it up and down with the little rheostat. Those are like 27 bucks on, on uh, eBay. It's not worth it. It really isn't. And everything right back where it was. Put a, a, I'm gonna put a screw in right there. You know, so we're gonna that rusty old one. Okay, there's one that's not rusty and old. Okay, so um, now everything else just goes back to where it was. using the wrap up the, all the excess wires also. Everything else goes in reverse. You could take a picture if you've never done it before. If you know how to read the wiring diagrams, you can use that. The nice thing about these dinosaur boards, these aftermarket boards, and the newer boards is they actually label what things uh, are for a change. So you can either do the one, two, three message as the customer did, or uh, you can do the one, two, threes, or if you know what everything is, you don't need them. But if you want to do them fast, take a nice little Sharpie and do what he did. Make for putting the things back on. If you wonder what this last red one that has a terminal on, this board's designed for a three-way. This unit here is a two-way, but a three-way actually has one extra uh, heating element, and the extra heating element is a 12-volt heating element. So that's what this board's designed for. And those are not efficient on battery, right? Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> People think that it's like, oh, solar panel. No, that's a, that's 30 amps. It has a 30 amp fuse, is what that has. So, 
that's the opposite of efficient. Okay, so now we got these, which are your, your gas lines, your gas valve. Doesn't matter which one goes where, it's just an electromagnet. That's what that is. That's your ground. Got a nice little screw hole down there for that. And put everything back on there. There's a little strap for that. Miter wire goes all the way back up into this hole where the little slot is, like such. Put this back on. That's on. Now, you don't have to do this. You can use zip ties if you want, but these are just kind of wrapped around like this a couple of times. That's what they do. And again, like I said, for how old this fridge is, I'm amazed that the clips that hold the wires are still, are not broken apart, because usually they are. Put those around there. We put these on. And then he had a ground wire. Fired right, right up. up. And so your reigniter works well. Okay, y'all. It's always, yeah, it's always worked great. So we're rocking and rolling again. Put this baby back on.